we have a panel um, with um, Dr. Young, Dr. Kim, and Dr. Bay, and um, we're gonna we're gonna sort of like go around the the horn a bit. Chris, you you, you just gave your um, presentation on transforaminal, so why don't we um, jump to Dr. Chol Kim and and sort of talk about what what type of uh, endoscopic spine surgery you perform and sort of um, give your background on, on how you were introduced, Chol. Um, did she, should we pull up that little that short little talk that I put together? It's about the last three minutes. I'm bringing it up. Awesome. awesome. Okay, I wasn't exactly sure what I was supposed to do with this, other than um, kind of put something together for three minutes, and it seems like I just want to kind of put it into perspective. So um, thank you very much for having me, and. Um, Hopefully we'll get lots of questions. <laughs> okay, so the, the question really boils down to, um, you know, when is it better to go interlaminar versus transforaminal? Um, I would say that the majority of our work is done transforaminally, uh, and that's where the greatest amount of experience is. But um, when we're trying to decide about interlaminar versus transforaminal surgery, it really is about geometry and access um, to the surgical target site. So uh, here's a typical patient um, with a herniated disc and, and radiculopathy. This thing is going ahead all by itself. It's got a mind of its own. Sorry, I'm backing it up. So typical patient that uh, presents to all of our clinics is a gentleman with uh, back pain and radiculopathy. This is an L5, S1 disc herniation. So if we're gonna to try to take care of this um, and we go to our, our kind of initial strategy, which is transforaminal, um, I think I just have a delay in the clicking. Okay, so here's the transforaminal approach. Here's the problem with the transforaminal approach at L5S1. It is very difficult to get lateral enough and flat enough so that you can reach up into the canal. And so if you look at this figure and you have this type of surgical corridor, which is very common for L5S1, you can't really reach much past this yellow region right there because of the, just the geometry. So if you have a disc herniation that's uh, more posterior than that, it can be very challenging to reach up and grab that disc herniation, especially if you can't even confirm at the end of the case uh, that that bump is uh, resolved. Now, on top of all that, if the iliac crest is in the way and you have a patient with a really narrow iliac crest or a very deep-seated pelvis, Ashley, can you do me a favor? Can you um, ask, uh, exit this uh, slideshow mode and just confirm that the slideshow isn't set up um, under use rehearsed timings? Just unclick that little box so it doesn't advance by itself. So Chol, do you, do you favor transforaminal or interlaminar? Transforaminal because it's usually easier. I'll get to that in a second. Um, and I only do interlaminar when the transforaminal has uh, some drawback of some type. Just because of ergonomics, experience, um, uh, the comfort of where your arms are sitting, um, et cetera. So as we wait until your um, talk gets put up again, Dr. Bay, how about, how about you? What, what's your preference? Is it interlaminar or transforaminal? And I know you've had a vast experience with endoscopic surgery, so tell us a little bit about your experience. Uh, my primary uh, option for this tectomy is a uh, transforaminal approach for every level. Or especially at the L5S level, someone says high iliac crest are uh, a barrier to their corridor. But uh, if you uh, move your uh, skin entry point a little bit more cranial or more medial, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, your trajectory will be uh, safely guide you uh, pass through the upper part of the neural frame and 
just next to the isthmus, and then you can reach into the spinal canal. After that, if you do a, a gentle foramenoplasty, you can enlarge your foramen and uh, introduce your endoscopy as well. So uh, in case of the stenosis or some uh, uh, high-grade downward migration cases at the L5 level, I think our uh, interlaminal approach has a great benefit, but otherwise I would choose a uh, transforamen approach. Got it, thank you. Chol, why don't you continue on with your uh, presentation? Yep, I'm almost done here. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I just need to get control over the perfect. So Chol, how many, how many cases have you done and how many cases do you think it takes before you feel comfortable doing these? Um, I've probably done between 50 and 100 interlaminars and probably 1,000 transforaminals. I would say that um, depending on your endoscopic experience to begin with and the type of program that you go to to prepare for your first few cases, you should be able to get it down to about five cases. But if you don't prepare, it could be over 20. So I, I think the uh, whole learning curve issue um, has we have to take into consideration all the things that affect the learning curve, including how you prepare for your first set of cases. Um, so having said all that, I can't figure out how to re back up this slide. Um, the transforaminal approach is easier because it is a true um, surgical target site that has its own space, whereas an interlaminar approach, you have to create a potential space. So there is some safety margin in there. Um, where you don't have to retract anything to get into the working triangle. Also, if you just see how we're standing, it's much more comfortable standing in a transforaminal approach with the patient prone versus an interlaminar approach where we have the scope going straight up and down and you're working with your arms way up high um, and it's just cumbersome and awkward in terms of ergonomics. Um, but there are times where you just have to suck it up, and those times are when, um, for me, the two following scenarios. If there's severe neuroforaminal stenosis, it's, it's scary going transforaminal because that's when you get the postoperative radiculitis. Um, or when the herniation is more central and you cannot reach across, especially L5-S1, then I like to go interlaminar. And I would say that most L5-S1 disc herniations I now undertake interlaminar, although I'm always looking to try to fix it transforaminal because it's easier, but most of the time I find myself going interlaminar um, because it's, uh, um, I have a lot less postoperative radiculitis. I go transforaminal for everything else at L4 or 5 and above. Um, if they had a previous lamy, I like to go transforaminal. Uh, for foraminal and far lateral discrimination, I like to go transforaminal. So it's not it's not about like which, which technique is more difficult. It's all about kind of the clinical scenario and the access and the trajectories, et cetera. Great. Thanks for making that, um, for setting up that presentation, Joel. Um, so it, are, are those indications pretty consistent um, for the panelists here? Like, is it that if you're at L5-S1, you tend to go a little bit more interlaminar and, and anything above L5-S1, it's more transforaminal? Um, what do you think, Chris? Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, it's certainly a lot easier transforaminal L4-5 and, and above. Uh, if you can access that herniation, you can target it. And again, you know, based on the geometry and the patient's anatomy. Um, for L5-S1, you know, one of the nice things about transforaminal is if you have a foraminal herniation, actually, because that's hard to do just a discectomy either from a direct posterior approach, interlaminar, endoscopic, or microscopic, or even a paris, uh, you know, extraframal approach uh, with, a, with a tube. Um, and so a lot of people will do like T-lifts for that. So sometimes you can help get it with the endoscope because it's smaller and get in there if it's framal or extraframal and avoid the, the T-lift. So that's one of the, one extra caveat at L5-S1 that it's, it's useful. Um, for me, I don't typically do any interlaminar because if I'm going posterior, I might be just to do a little uh, hemilaminotomy, uh, microdiscectomy approach. Because going through the same tissue planes and uh, it's just, to me, it's faster and, and I can get more bony resection 
if I need to, because typically if they have some lateral recess stenosis or central stenosis, that's when I'll, I'll do the, the more microscopic typical technique. So even at L5S1, you, you're, you don't do interlaminars? I haven't. I haven't. Um, I think it's ideal for that if it's an, a large extruded and caudally migrated herniation uh, because it's right there in the interlaminar window. So um, that is a perfect one for interlaminar. I just haven't adopted that. Um, you know, I think same thing with Chol. You know, uh, we as surgeons, you got to pick and choose what techniques you're going to adopt. And, you know, that's just something that's a little bit more of, uh, radiation exposure checking you know where your um, instruments are compared to just the posterior microscopic approach and ergonomically it's not as nice because you are you know having your hands up high and you know not great on your shoulders so um, I just haven't adopted that. Dr. Big, can you give us uh, some pointers on um, what to do about the crest at L5S1 the iliac crest? So uh, the, uh, in case of the high iliac crest and uh, narrow iliac crest, it's more difficult to approach through the foramen. But actually, you, you, you may think the iliac crest is a, a guide plan for your transforamen approach. So if you move uh, your skin entry point more cranial up to L45 level or above, and uh, uh, move your entry point more medial side, uh, you can uh, uh, go next to the uh, isthmus and then you can slip into the uh, spinal canal. So just, that is a little bit uh, uh, higher uh, uh, and uh, steeper approach than usual transformer approach. But uh, anyway, uh, you can reach into the spinal canal in that way to, to ex expand your neural frame and, and then uh, the transformer approach is uh, uh, the same way as the uh, other uh, techniques. So I call it this uh, 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 isthmic technique, uh, a, a variant of transformer approach. Um, we have a we have a question from um, one of the uh, uh, panelists, Dr. Uh, Richard Chua. His question is: Are there any head-to-head -head studies on endoscopic versus microscopic approaches? Joel? Say that again. Are there any head-to-head -head studies on endoscopic versus microscopic approaches? Oh my goodness, there's so many studies out there uh, comparing um, endoscopic surgery versus microdiscectomies. There's um, uh, several meta-analyses, um, and they all show that they're roughly equivalent, um, and in some cases the endoscopic surgery is slightly better, but it's been very difficult to show um, any clinically meaningful differences in the literature. But I'm sure everyone that's done a lot of endoscopic surgery, there's a clear difference between a microdiscectomy and a endoscopic discectomy, especially during the first month. The patients are doing just dramatically better. It's just really hard to show in the literature. You think so? But I'm curious. I'm curious to know what the other panelists think about. You know their perceptions of the difference between endoscopic and microdiscectomy, even though tons of studies have been out there that are failing to show a significant improvement. Yeah, I think there's a lot of studies uh, comparing them, and statistically, they're all equivalent. Uh, the studies that are um, published uh, do show a tendency to have a little bit better. Uh, some like results just on the parameters that they used and like return to work and you know it's a little less invasive so uh, they they recover a little bit faster um, but you know these are also studies that are done by students that do both and so are, are facile at both so they've kind of gone through the learning curve um, but I think you know you get the pressure off the disc and the patient's gonna be happy and you can do it either way. Uh, so as long as you can get the pressure off the disc, you know, it really doesn't matter the incision size, eventually they're gonna recover. But um, with the, uh, I think the important point is, you know, there's not necessarily one that's better than the other, but uh, they're both effective at relieving that nerve root compression. And of course, you know, a lot of minimally invasive surgeons are uh, thinking is, is if you can do the same thing, 
but minimize damage to what Larry Coog calls the, uh, the innocent bystanders, which are the, the bone and the muscle and all that stuff um, that get in your way between you and the disc, then, you know, if you can accomplish the same thing and, and cause less trauma, then possibly be better for the patients. But you have to be able to get the, the pressure off the nerve, and that's the main point. And then um, we, we have one last question. Um, this is for Dr. Bay. Um, I, I would say that endoscopic spine surgery is more common, if not maybe almost becoming standard of care in parts of Asia. But here in the United States, we're still sort of, there's this reticence of actually adopting it. And I think it has to do with um, the steep learning curve, as well as maybe some re reimbursement issues. So in, in Korea, how is it that so many surgeons, spine surgeons, are adopting and have really, really um, taken on endoscopic spine surgery to be part of every, everything that they do, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. It's, I think it's a part of the cultural uh, background because in Korea, uh, like in, in the U.S., many patients are afraid of uh, actual surgery, open surgery. They are afraid of vaginal anesthesia as well. So, uh, uh, luckily. Uh, uh, in Korea, we start uh, many uh, the uh, first generation of doctors uh, have uh, started uh, endoscopic surgery in early times, and and uh, it, it quickly spread all of the Korea. So uh, many patients are recognizing uh, the the benefit uh, the, the the benefit of the endoscopic surgery, and they are requiring requiring the endoscopic surgery to, to surgeons. So that's how the, uh, uh, we have so, so many uh, endoscopic surgeons in Korea than the U.S. Got it. 